Hello everyone. Uh, today's uh, topic of discussion will be oral habits. Uh, the learning outcomes uh, of this lecture is uh, to be in a position to classify different types of habits, describe the etiological factors of habits, formulate a diagnosis based on the clinical features, and also plan the management of these habits. So you will be able to understand all these at the end of this lecture. So what are oral habits? So uh, let's just start with the, what exactly is a habit. So the same uh, holds good for an oral habit as well. A habit is any tendency towards an act that has become a repeated performance, relatively fixed, consistent, and easy to perform by an individual. So it was Darwin in 1957 who defined a habit as a fixed or a constant practice established by frequent repetitions. So uh, I'm uh, guessing most of us do have uh, some kind of habit or uh, most of us had some kind of a bad habit during our uh, childhood years. Uh, and over the years, uh, we've uh, overcome that. So do let me know uh, as to what kind of habits you had and uh, what methods you uh, used to overcome those or what uh, methods your parents used to overcome uh, the habits you had. And did you ever uh, had to visit a dentist or an orthodontist or a worst case scenario, a psychiatrist? Uh, to deal with your habit. So do uh, let me know on these so that we can have uh, a more uh, uh, thorough understanding from uh, each of your uh, individual perspective. So how is oral habits classified? There are several uh, classifications to this. Uh, it was William in 1923 who classified oral habits as either uh, useful or harmful. Useful habits are something which are uh, an extension of a normal physiological function, whereas harmful habits are those which uh, have an adverse effect on the teeth or the supporting structures of the teeth. Uh, then it was uh, Kingsley in uh, 1956 who uh, came out with another classification uh, based on functional, muscular, postural and combined muscular. Uh, Morrison Bohana uh, classified it as pressure, non-pressure, and uh, biting habits. Uh, Klein uh, classified it as empty and meaningful, and Finn classified it as uh, compulsive and non-compulsive. So you can uh, just know these uh, classifications and uh, more details on this uh, will be available in the the lecture notes so you can go through those so four components uh, make up the tetrad of a habit which influence the amount of deformity uh, you will uh, see in a particular individual and these are frequency duration intensity and direction frequency is basically the number of times a particular habit is performed so more the indulgence, more will be the deformation, you see. Uh, duration is uh, the total amount of time spent performing a particular habit. So longer the duration, greater uh, the deformation. Uh, the next one is the intensity of the habit. That is the more force or uh, the vigor with which a, perf a habit is performed uh, will lead to more uh, deformation and the direction. So this depends on the concurrent force vectors which are uh, acting on the teeth and the oral structures. So all these four put together can influence uh, the amount of deformity or deformation you see in a particular individual who is performing or has performed a particular kind of habit. Now coming to the types of oral habits, uh, there is thumb and uh, digit sucking, tongue thrusting, mouth breathing, bruxism, lip biting, 
nail biting and masochistic habits. So we'll go into the details of each of these in the coming slides. So the first habit we'll be discussing is the thumb and digit sucking. Uh, it was Jelen in 1978 who defined this habit as the placement of thumb or one or more fingers in varying depths into the mouth. So what is the etiology of thumb and digit sucking? So uh, for uh, understanding the etiology, you'll have to know uh, the different uh, mechanisms or the theories behind it. So basically there is fusion theory, there is oral drive theory, there is Benjamin's rooting reflex and also the lack of uh, parental love or parental love deprivation. So what does the Freudian theory say about uh, thumb and digit sucking? It says that the habit is developed from an inherent psychosexual drive uh, and it also is developed uh, as uh, the habit is seen as a pleasurable erotic stimulation of the lips and mouth uh, wherein the infant associates this particular habit with a pleasurable feeling uh, such as uh, satisfaction of hunger or uh, uh, a sense of security. Um, also uh, what you have to understand here is a sudden prevention of the habit can uh, lead to insecurity uh, wherein uh, uh, the child might uh, pick up on some other kind of a habit or the existent uh, insecurity in a child might be the root cause of this particular uh, habit of, uh, from developing in the first instance. So you have to assess uh, the overall uh, situation and then understand why this particular habit uh, is existing uh, in a particular uh, infant. Uh, the next theory is the oral drive theory, which says that prolonged suckling or breastfeeding would also lead to thumb sucking. So not necessarily breastfeeding, it might be on a pacifier or it might be on a uh, uh, the infant being fed on a, a bottle. Um, also, the prolongation of nursing strengthens the oral drive and uh, hence to satisfy this, satisfy this particular uh, sensation or this experience, the child is already recognized. The child will start uh, sucking his or her thumb. The next theory is Benjamin's rooting reflex. Uh, it says that sucking arises from the rooting or placing reflex which is seen in all mammalian infants. Uh, rooting reflex is something uh, when, uh, which happens when there is movement of the infant's head and tongue towards an object touching the cheek. So usually under normal circumstances, uh, it's the mother's breast or a finger or a pacifier which is touching the uh, infant's cheek. Uh, when uh, the baby is not feeding or when the infant is not uh, on a pacifier, he or she might find it, uh, find it that their uh, fingers are easily accessible and which can easily be placed into their uh, mouths. And that's how uh, the thumb and digit sucking habit can actually start. But uh, however, uh, in normal infants, this habit is seen to disappear uh, within uh, an age range of around seven to eight months. Uh, the next um, theory is uh, from a psychological aspect. Uh, so here, if uh, there is any kind of a deprivation of parental love, care or affection, and uh, a resultant uh, feeling of insecurity developing in the child or an infant can lead to the development of uh, a thumb and digit sucking habit as we saw in the Freudian uh, theory as well wherein it says that uh, to overcome that uh, insecurity a child might start finding solace in sucking on their digit or thumb. So you can uh, divide uh, this habit into three phases. Uh, the first phase um, ending at three years. 
So if you see uh, a child within uh, this age group uh, performing uh, a, a thumb and digit sucking habit, then you can easily uh, convey to the parents or the caregivers that it's a normal uh, process and uh, it's a normal habit which will uh, see uh, it stop at around three years of age. So you can tell them that it's uh, something uh, the child uh, will overcome. Uh, if you see it uh, extend to beyond three years, up to six and a half years of age group, then you'll have to check for um, uh, anxiety issues in the, in the child. You'll also have to check the amount of time uh, the child gets to spend with their parents or any other uh, uh, psychological uh, issues affecting the child. Uh, and if you see anything beyond this age limit, that's beyond six years, that is uh, a child attending class one or class two beyond that, you'll have to subject uh, them to uh, a psychiatric uh, uh, consultation uh, wherein uh, a psychiatrist is better placed to understand and uh, extract uh, information pertaining to anxiety or any other deep-rooted uh, psychological issues uh, the child is facing. So the child has to be part of that, uh, the parents have to be part of that, our uh, uh, caregivers have to be part of that. Uh, so this is an important thing as a dentist you will also come across children of all these age groups and uh, you are in a position to uh, convey to the parents what is normal and what is abnormal and when uh, they need uh, uh, a consultation from a specialist uh, so this is your responsibility so you should identify the signs and also uh, be in a position to determine what needs to be done and how you're going to do that and how do you address this particular issue. So how do you classify a thumb and digit sucking? So um, it's classified uh, as uh, alpha, beta and gamma by Cook and also it's uh, based on the clinical classification of normal and abnormal. So more, de more details on this you will find in the lecture notes because uh, uh, if you remember uh, this small classification, it's, it should suffice for now. So what are the clinical features you will notice in an infant uh, performing this particular habit. Uh, there will be proclination of maxillary incisors. Uh, you'll have to again remember the tetrad. So there is direction, there is force, duration and frequency. So proclination of maxillary incisors, lingual tipping of mandibular incisors, anterior open bite, narrow maxillary arch and resultant posterior cross bite. There might be uh, tongue trust habit developing concurrently or it might be seen already. Uh, upper lip is hypotonic and lower part of the face uh, exhibits hyperactive mentalis activity. So how do you diagnose uh, this habit? You will need to ask for uh, the feeding habits of the infant and also uh, the kind of uh, parental care the child is receiving. Uh, however, you can uh, check uh, the child's uh, fingers uh, and also you can look for um, excessively clean nails and any callus formation on the finger. Uh, if the child is sucking uh, their thumb, you can look for a clean dishpan thumb, which is uh, seen on the image. So once you've found that the habit exists, how do you break the habit? So there is a hypothesis which says uh, it can be broken by a conscious, forced and purposeful repetition of uh, undoing the habit. That is, you have to consciously tell the, uh, the child not to perform the habit. You have to force the child not to perform the habit. And also you have to uh, purposefully uh, 
uh, repeat the same instructions on and off so that the child will uh, have uh, an aversion to the habit uh, he or she is performing. Uh, however, uh, there is uh, a particular technique you can follow. So you have to make the child sit in front of a mirror and perform the habit. So uh, the child is not allowed to, uh, uh, you know, drift away or uh, 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 look elsewhere, but uh, rather concentrate on uh, looking at himself or herself in the mirror. So this creates uh, an unpleasurable uh, experience for them and uh, the psychological pleasure which they actually receive by performing the habit is uh, negated and then uh, they will uh, find it less and less uh, pleasurable thereby uh, leading to a cessation of the habit. However, uh, you can also use some mechanical aids to stop this habit. Uh, you can give uh, the child um, a removable or a fixed habit breaker, such as a tongue crib or a bluegrass appliance. You can see those on the images. And uh, you can bandage the thumb and the elbow of the kid or the child so that uh, it is physically impossible for them to uh, suck uh, on the bandage or uh, or their uh, thumb uh, which has already been bandaged uh, or else you can use some uh, chemicals such as or uh, medicaments such as uh, pepper you can use quinine uh, which has a very unpleasant taste or uh, asafoetida uh, so that uh, that taste will be a uh, deterrent to putting their thumb into the mouth Okay, I believe that was a uh, break from the mundane listening. Uh, so the next habit we'll be uh, discussing is uh, tongue thrusting. So Schneider in 1982 defined this habit as a forward placement of the tongue between the anterior teeth and against the lower lip during swallowing. So coming to the etiology of tongue trusting, so there are genetic factors, there is a learned behavior habit, mechanical restriction, neurological disturbance, and psychogenic factors. So genetic factors are specific anatomic or neuromuscular variations in the orofacial region, which might lead to this uh, particular uh, habit from developing, or it can, it can be a learned pattern, that is, uh, if, if uh, there was an improper uh, bottle feeding technique used or uh, the infant was uh, uh, sucking their thumb for a prolonged period of time, uh, any long-standing upper respiratory tract infection or any tenderness in the gingiva or the teeth uh, which caused a change in the swallowing pattern it can also uh, lead to the development of tongue trusting. Uh, mechanical restrictions such as the presence of macroglossia or enlargement of the tongue or hypertrophy of the tongue, enlarged tonsils and adenoids or uh, constricted maxillary arches or uh, mandibular arches can also cause the tongue to uh, protrude each time uh, uh, the, uh, the child uh, swallows. Um, uh, any neurological disturbance, uh, neural or motor disability disorders can also lead to uh, the habit from developing. Uh, finally, the psychogenic uh, factors such as uh, forced discontinuation of other habits. We already discussed if you forcefully uh, stop the child from sucking their thumb or finger, uh, a new habit such as this might uh, develop. So this habit is classified as uh, anterior and posterior by Backland, simple, complex, and retained infantile swallow by Moyer, and uh, Brainer and Holt uh, classified as non-deforming, deforming, anterior, deforming lateral, deforming anterior, and lateral. So more details on this you will find in your lecture notes. So you can refer to those. Uh, what are the clinical features uh, you will notice in an individual who is having tongue a trusting habit? 
there will be proclination of the anterior teeth, anterior open bite, bimaxillary protrusion, posterior open bite, posterior cross bite, lip incompetency, disturbed or slurred speech, uh, or there can be a lisp uh, that is that's the kind of uh, noise you will hear whenever they try to speak or uh, pronounce a certain kind of words, uh, especially the S, N, T, D, T, so there will be that kind of uh, uh, a noise uh, produced. Uh, increased anterior facial height and also spacing between teeth. So these are all clinical features which will help you in identifying uh, the habit. Uh, so, how do you diagnose this habit? So, you will ask for any uh, existing uh, digit sucking or thumb sucking habit or uh, the presence of any upper respiratory tract infection and you will also look for any neuromuscular problems, the, the swallow pattern and especially the tongue or the position of the tongue uh, when the uh, uh, the swallowing uh, happens and also uh, you will look for the posture of the tongue at rest. So these are all the uh, different uh, ways of uh, diagnosing this particular habit. So once you've uh, found the habit, so how do you break it? That's the most important thing. So how do you manage this particular habit? So uh, basically, there are two things. One is habit interception and the other one is the treatment of malocclusion. If the malocclusion is what caused the habit in the first instance, so uh, you can give them uh, certain habit breakers such as a habit breaking uh, appliance along with a tongue crib. And you can also teach them uh, various uh, myofunctional uh, exercises such as uh, one elastic swallow, or uh, placing the tongue at the uh, rugae region and holding it there for uh, five minutes or uh, you can and then swallowing and then you can also teach them uh, uh, something like whistling gargling yawning so any habit which is going to prevent the tongue from forcefully going forward so that is how uh, you can uh, train the musculature and also prevent this habit from recurring which has to be done over a period of time before uh, uh, the swallowing, swallowing pattern is uh, corrected and uh, the habit is uh, uh, changed or stopped. Uh, the next habit we will be discussing is uh, mouth breathing. So it was Chopra in 1951 who defined this habit as a habitual respiration through the mouth instead of the nose. So you can see you know, patients having uh, uh, an open mouth and uh, breathing through the mouth instead of the nose. So you can easily discern such uh, uh, things in a patient as they walk in and as you're tra talking to them. At rest, you will be able to see that they stay open mouth and uh, closing the mouth would uh, need them to exert some kind of a forceful closure of the mouth. So that's what is going to help you identify this particular habit. Uh, the etiology of mouth breathing. So here uh, people with ectomorphic facial form that is long, narrow and elongated facial form are more predisposed to having uh, mouth breathing and uh, people having any kind of a nasal obstruction that is hypertrophic turbinate or enlarged adenoids also have uh, a tendency to breathe through their mouth and uh, a presence of any intranasal defects that is deviated nasal septum or nasal polyps will also encourage the patient to develop a mouth breathing habit. So the classification is a simple one. It was Simon Finn who classified mouth breathing as obstructive, habitual, or anatomic. So if you know the etiology, it's easy to understand the classification. Uh, what are the clinical features uh, you will come across? So they will have 
uh, a long and narrow face, narrow nasal passage, short and flaccid upper lip, an expressionless or blank face, increased overchit, anterior marginal gingivitis because the gingiva is uh, rendered dry and uh, hence there is uh, presence of marginal gingivitis, uh, dryness of mouth and also presence of anterior open bite. And how do you diagnose uh, mouth breathing? Uh, you can take uh, a history and uh, correlate it with the clinical features you notice. You can also perform a clinical examination that is a two mirror test, a water holding test or a butterfly test. Uh, in the mirror uh, test, you will see that the mirror gets condensed uh, and uh, thereby you can understand if uh, the patient is breathing through their mouth. Uh, if you ask the patient to hold water uh, in their mouth for a prolonged period of time, they'll find it difficult as they are mouth breathers, so they need to open their mouth or they are forced to open their mouth. So uh, this is also a test to determine that. And the butterfly test is uh, wherein you, uh, you uh, take a piece of uh, gauze or cotton and uh, shape it in the butterfly uh, uh, outline and then you place it uh, near the nostrils and then you're able to understand if there is a flutter then you can understand that they are breathing through the uh, nostrils or else you can understand uh, they breathe through their mouth uh, and also um, using cephalometrics and um, rhino manometry uh, you will find more details in your uh, lecture notes on these uh, two techniques. So once you found the habit, how do you break it? So it depends on the etiology. If there's any obstruction to the nasal uh, cavity or the nasal passage, uh, removal of that nasal obstruction or correction of the nasal respiratory pathology, that is uh, removal of the polyps or correction of the deviated nasal septum, uh, will uh, result in uh, uh, cessation of mouth uh, breathing. Uh, so it will definitely need an ENT consult. And also, uh, if there are any anatomical uh, uh, structures uh, which are preventing uh, uh, the patient from uh, obtaining a lip seal, that uh, then you can subject them to certain exercises or uh, you can uh, subject them to a surgical lengthening of the lips uh, or uh, there can also be maxillary expansion that is palatal expansion as it is known to increase the nasal volume. Uh, also if it's habitual you can give them a habit uh, breaking appliance such as a vestibular screen which will force them to breathe through their nose. So however uh, if it's habitual and if they do have any obstruction so uh, the first thing should be to correct the obstruction before you uh, uh, break uh, the habit using an appliance so that is what is important for you to know so the next habit we are going to discuss is bruxism i think we've all done this when you were writing your exams when you were in a stressful situation when you were uh, in a very competitive um, uh, mode or when you were in a very aggressive mode when someone was breaking into your lane or when someone honked at you or when someone cut across a queue so i think you've experienced this clenching of your teeth you've experienced this uh, grinding or uh, tapping of your teeth so that's bruxism for you. So it is the term used to indicate non-functional contact of teeth, which may include clenching, smashing, grinding, and tapping of teeth. And this definition was put forth by Rubina in 1986. So coming to the etiology of bruxism, so there is uh, psychological factors such as excessive rage or excessive anxiety, which might lead to bruxism. Uh, presence of any occlusal uh, discrepancies, uh, any systemic factors such as magnesium deficiency or allergies can also lead to bruxism. 
and also presence of any occupational factors can result in a person experiencing bruxism. So what are the types of bruxism? Uh, there is diurnal and nocturnal. Diurnal is uh, performing this excessive uh, plunging during daytime and nocturnal is during night or during uh, sleep. And uh, what are the clinical features? So you will see mm, occlusal wear facets, fractured teeth and restorations. So the restorations can no longer withstand huge amount of uh, stress on them and they will fracture. Um, the, uh, the, there can be excessive mobility of teeth and also uh, the masticatory muscles might be hypertrophied because of uh, constant uh, 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 clenching uh, and also there might be associated uh, impromandibular uh, joint pain or uh, pain of the uh, muscles of uh, mastication or uh, the muscles of uh, the head and neck region. So how do you diagnose uh, bruxism? So you can use an articulating paper to check for any occlusal uh, discrepancies and you can also subject the patient to an electromyography examination to understand uh, how the muscles are being uh, overworked and uh, once you know this you can um, use various techniques to break the habit. Uh, you can subject the patient to psychological counseling. You can subject them to orthodontics or give them an occlusal splint to relieve uh, the constant uh, clenching. You can also subject them to hypnosis, any relaxing exercises, meditation, yoga, and so on. Uh, so basically, uh, the aim would be for the patient to unclench. And uh, you can also tell them to uh, make a conscious effort to unclench during uh, diurnal uh, 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 types of uh, bruxism, uh, wherein if they are uh, doing uh, any work or they are uh, sitting by a table or writing or doing any activity uh, per se, they can uh, make a conscious effort to unclench. Okay. So the next habit uh, we'll be discussing is lip biting. So this is a habit that involves the manipulation of the lips and perioral structures. So any kind of a manipulation that includes biting or peeling off uh, the mucosal layer or uh, pinching it. So all these are considered as uh, a deleterious uh, habit. So how do you classify lip biting? So it's wetting the lips with the tongue and pulling the lips into the mouth between the teeth. Okay, these are two uh, types of uh, lip biting uh, you will see. However, there are three different kinds of uh, lip biting uh, habit. One is lip sucking, uh, lip wetting, and lip biting. So uh, there might be one or more uh, which is uh, performed. So they might constantly wet their lips and then they might also suck on their lips and then during the same they might bite on the mucosal layer so one or more of these are seen in this particular habit so what are the clinical features um, it is one of uh, the habits which can be developed uh, after a forced discontinuation of thumb sucking habit so uh, under normal circumstances it is the lower lip which is usually affected uh, also there is presence of proclined upper incisors there is um, cracking of uh, the lips or uh, the presence of extremely uh, chapped lips because of constant wetting and the uh, presence of uh, hypertrophic and redundant lower lip is also seen as a clinical feature. Uh, so what is the treatment? You can give them a lip bumper which will prevent them from uh, nicking or uh, uh, continuing this habit uh, for a period of time and uh, will cause the cessation of this habit. So the next habit we'll be discussing is nail biting. So here what happens is uh, the individual 
constantly either bytes or choose on their uh, names. So the habit does not produce any gross mod occlusion. However, there can be some minor irregularities such as rotation, wear of incisal edges and uh, minor crowding seen. Uh, for the clinical features, you might notice crowding, you might notice rotation of certain teeth and also a presence of attrition of the lower or upper anterior. And when it comes to treating such cases, um, there can be no treatment at times because uh, the habit might be a minor one or uh, uh, you have to find uh, ways uh, for the patient uh, to distract uh, himself or herself uh, uh, while doing uh, this habit. And also uh, there has to be a constant reminder from uh, either the parent or a sibling or a peer who can uh, encourage them to stop performing this act and uh, the final one is uh, masochistic habits so these are habits in which the child enjoys inflicting damage to themselves so they might be pricking the gingiva or they might start chewing the inside of the cheek that is the mucosal layer of the lip or else they might even uh, cause ulcerations on their tongue lip or cheek Okay, so as you can see in the images, there can be a wide ranging uh, ulcerations of the oral mucosa. Uh, management would be to subject the patients to psychiatric uh, counseling, uh, and the psychologist will uh, determine the next course of action. And if it is occurring in conjunction with certain other oral habits, so you may need to step in and um, uh, treat those uh, habits accordingly wherein uh, the masochistic habits will also uh, uh, cease to continue and the patient can be relieved of this uh, extremely deleterious habit. Okay, with that we've come to the last slide of uh, today's lecture. I hope uh, uh, today's lecture has given you a brief insight into the different types of oral habits uh, you might come across in your professional career. So as we've discussed earlier, uh, it is important for you to uh, understand that uh, often uh, these habits uh, invariably have some uh, psychological aspects associated with it. So identifying that and also treating those are of prime importance in uh, uh, stopping or uh, uh, putting an end to these habits. Uh, so with that, uh, we shall uh, end today's lecture. Uh, thank you for listening.